Thank you everyone for coming to this session. As Pierce said, I work at Microsoft and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I do there. Um, the title of my talk is about when brands talk and how we're using AI to empower conversation. And it's interesting to think about how we can use that kind of technology in retail environments. When I talked to peers early on about this, it, it sparked my imagination. And uh, I can talk about how we're focused in one way today, and everybody will recognize that, um, and, and where we see the opportunity in the future. Now, Nat, keep in mind that I come from the product side of this and specifically from the design side. So while there, there's a lot of technological uh, questions to be answered, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on some of that, but I'm going to go deeper around the design considerations around that. So jumping in, this is what I'm going to talk about. You know, usually when I give these talks, I talk about the future last, but since it seems appropriate to talk about the future first, since what I'm going to say about the future is probably something that everybody's already thought about. So let's get that out of the way. And then I'm going to jump into designing personality and my history with that. And then some of the considerations and as well as caveats around uh, what investment and what, what kind of uh, design thinking needs to go into this kind of approach. So for the future, I think we'd all agree it holds uh, unprecedented opportunity across the board. But what I'm interested in is the opportunity around this voice-driven interaction. We call it natural language interaction, but I think people, people understand it as, hey, I use my voice to do a thing. And now, of course, with speakers in all our homes, we're, we're, we're very familiar with it. We're becoming very accustomed to it. It's early on. It's, it's not perfect but we all know what it is. I think five years ago, this, this world we live in now was not even really conceivable by the average person. And so looking at what's going on in the world today, I see that there's a lot of opportunity where we need less human contact. And there's probably been great conversations around this, this gathering about, you know, what does COVID-19, post-COVID-19 mean? Like this choice by Amazon is made uh, primarily for uh, a new model of, of retail where we can go in and, and not touch, uh, not, not engage with human beings, but it, it, it takes on new meaning in the era that we're in now. And then, of course, where there's a curated journey, there's an excellent opportunity for, for voice interactivity. Um, this is obviously an IKEA uh, layout, and we all, probably most everyone on the call is familiar with the IKEA layout and how that works. But we can see it as a structural journey that we can create for customers. We can create, we can curate and design that that uh, retail experience, not only for you know a better conversion rate at the end of it, but perhaps also because we have to again take into consideration the way people are operating in this new world that we're in. And then, of course, we hear a lot about this, where traditional boundaries don't exist. And VR and, and, and MR, virtual reality, mixed reality, is a big thing, big investment for Microsoft and the major tech companies and small tech companies. And we're starting to see a lot of creativity as far as engaging in this with meetings, for example. This is a picture of a Microsoft investment called Altspace VR. And we're having meetings in this space and we're getting more accustomed to that. And the, the technology is moving rapidly and consumers are beginning to invest in the space here too. And so we could see some great retail opportunity in mixed and, and virtual reality. And then of course, we already know this, it's where we live, but, but you know, suffice it to say, we're gonna go deeper here as people become more comfortable. Um, one of the great pieces of research that came out recently was done by Adobe because they've invested in voice-driven technologies and they've discovered that if a person has a speaker in their home, they are four times more likely to engage with an agent with their voice on their PC. That's a huge number. So we can see that that's all about comfort with this new technology and knowing that it's okay to fumble around or it's okay if it doesn't understand me. And as, as the technology gets better, uh, the speakers are gonna drive more engagement here. And then of course, what about where we're not at home, where we're not in a familiar space and a familiar voice might uh, actually soothe us or, or uh, be something that we're seeking. 
So there's opportunity there as well, just, just like all the brand work that we as retail companies do, um, we can see that people might might find some some you know comfort and some it, we might find engagement in places that we hadn't imagined because this kind of technology is not necessarily tied to a place. It's an ambient technology too. So there's a lot of lot of great possibilities there. And again, the unprecedented opportunity is this new brand expression opportunity. It's, it's how people can engage with brands in new ways. So as I said, I'm going to be talking about the design side. And when we talk about the design side of, of this, we really lean into the personality. Now, there's two ways to talk about personality. There's the personality that is the essence of a thing, kind of a personality that you might be reading uh, about me right now as well as then we also talk about the personality as kind of a persona, like, uh, you know, the radio personality or the television personality, that kind of a thing. So in tech, in tech, when we started to build agents, first Siri came out. And when uh, I became engaged with Cortana, which is our digital agent at Microsoft, uh, it was top secret. We hadn't released yet. And Siri was still the only one out there. And at those time, in, the, in those days, what we when we talked about this kind of entity building, the designing of that entity, we called it personality, more like the idea of the personality, the radio personality. So if I if I use that phrase, I wanted to be clear about the difference. That said, of course, we're designing a personality that emanates from the experience. So again, going down the path of this designing personality. I'll tell you a little bit about how I landed here. And that is, I'm a writer. I have a background in film and television. Uh, I've written all kinds of things. Um, before I was at Microsoft, I was working, uh, I was running two online stores uh, in the wine business, uh, two online stores and running the, uh, their uh, requisite digital marketing campaigns for Francis Ford Coppola Winery in Napa. And I came, to, I came to Microsoft and they hired me in because I have this film and television background. And uh, they wanted uh, me to find effective ways to bring video into content. Figure this was 12 years ago, right? YouTube was a relatively new thing. And so, uh, so I got a, a great job running a team of writers at Microsoft. But in those days, what we did was content. We wrote articles, help articles, which was a step up from the writing job in tech companies prior to that, which was primarily writing manuscripts, manuals for how you, you operate or how you uh, use any given system or feature or what have you. And we moved it online and that's when I entered the picture, but we called it content. These were articles. How do I print my document? Someone on my team would help with that. And then I transitioned into UX writing and a big portion of my team does that to this day. And by UX writing, that's more like the writing inside the user experience of a product, right? That could be a, an office product at Microsoft. In this case, I moved over to Xbox to work on the console. So I had writers working with design and engineering on how to create those flows. With that, in mind, I was ready to go down the path and I was ready to dig deep into Xbox. And, and I was asked to work on this, as I said, top secret project called Cortana, the digital assistant that we have at Microsoft. And uh, everything shifted. I created this team that wrote what Cortana said. We call it the small talk space or the chit chat space. And that's where anything that happens outside the domain uh, of the domain being the main objective of that agent. In Cortana's case, it was to be helpful, set reminders, these kinds of things that we're familiar with. But if somebody went outside of that space, we made a choice to answer that. And it's everything from, you know, what's your favorite movie? What, what kind of, what, what is your favorite color? To what do you think of the president? Those kinds of things. And we made the choice to answer those. And through that, what happened was, we realized we were designing the personality. There was a team of engineers, of visual designers, and my writing team that was designing this personality, the who of what, what the experience of Cortana was, when people wanted to know that. And what became evident was, even though uh, those resources were effective, the way that people identified it, this who of Cortana, was in what Cortana said. 
And so the, the, the design imperative around personality for Cortana was handed to me. And I had been, dri I've been driving, not Cortana necessarily, but the personality work for, for many years. I worked on Cortana for nearly six years. And then I was interested in something else. And that's where the bots kind of opened up. And I'm gonna talk a little more about Cortana and I'll talk about my current project now that we have at Microsoft. And basically what it is, is it's enabling bot developers to, to, to facilitate a personality into their bot experience if they choose that. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But now moving beyond bots, we're looking at what we call conversational UX, conversational user experience. And, and what we mean by that is, there doesn't necessarily have to be an entity. When we think of bots, we think of these things that pop up. They might have a little visual of a robot or something like that. It's an entity that's helping. But conversational UX doesn't require that. Conversational UX means that we just want to create a conversation back and forth. A great example is disambiguation in a given moment. If someone gets confused, they can ask a question, literally with their voice. And then we can respond with a vocal response. Now in there, you have the opportunity to, even if you're not gonna create that persona personality, the personality, the brand, what we want the company to feel like is still critical. And so what, what I've learned is over the years when I started in content and UX, we talked a lot about the voice and tone of the product. And I'm gonna go over a little bit of that. But that's all kind of evolved into the personality of the product. And it's a deeper understanding. It's something that you can poke at as a user, as opposed to the voice and tone comes one way, one direction. But even more, now that we talk about conversational UX and we're working with customers, we're moving away from the language of personality into brand expression. And I think that's more relevant to this audience, this, this conference and the future of retail uh, more so than ever. Okay, so a little bit about Cortana. As I said, I was asked to create the team that wrote what Cortana said, and so that's what we did. We wrote for Cortana, and the vast majority of the stuff we leaned into was pretty straightforward. Here, if you said, who are you? She'd say, I'm, I'm your personal assistant. You can tell me the things that interest you, and I'll keep it in my notebook. That way, I can make suggestions and keep you up to date. Of course, Cortana's voice is a lot nicer than mine, but you get the idea. Um, this is very straightforward stuff, and that was that was basically our key key deliverable. But what was interesting was we knew what people were asking. We knew what people were saying. We didn't know anything about them. It was completely uh, anonymous. But we we had aggregated uh, amounts of data that said, for example, a lot of people wanted Cortana to tell them a joke. And I resisted at first because I thought that's really off of the personality we're building, which is a helpful assistant, someone who's very businesslike and professional, someone who's willing to let their hair down if the customer asks for it. And finally, I gave in and we realized we weren't just writing for Cortana, we were also curating for Cortana. But that curation, the jokes that Cortana chooses to tell, had to be channeled through this established personality of the who of what Cortana was. And so a joke like this, a grasshopper walks into a bar, the bartender says, we've got a drink named after you. And the grasshopper says, you got a drink named Steve? This kind of joke, it's a classic old joke. But the key to this is it's pretty innocent. It generally gets a laugh. Nobody's thrown under the bus. It's just a light, fun kind of traditional joke. And so we had, we actually had a lot of fun once we kind of leaned into it and, uh, and determined what we considered a quality set of jokes for Cortana. So a lot of curation. We also did this with information. We might celebrate Black History Month, so we might throw some facts in there. That was really a wonderful part of our job. But then we looked for opportunities to really make that personality pop. Now, when you're designing a, 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 an experience like this, the thought is we're going to put personality throughout. But the truth is, when someone is doing their business that they want to do with that experience, let's just say task driven, you stay out of the way, right? If they need to get something done, just like a human being, if you saw someone in a store and it was clear they knew what they were doing, you wouldn't try to inject yourself into that or a good salesperson wouldn't. They'd let the person do what they want and stand aside when they needed them. Now, if everything was done and that same customer was ready to relax and, and uh, kind of, you know, have a moment of, of some levity, 
then the, the good salesperson would be able to uh, uh, respond in that moment and maybe bring some opinion in, these kinds of things. So we looked for the opportunity through what the customer was saying to Cortana. Again, we didn't know who they were. We just knew what they were saying. We found some people were saying, are you smart? Which is tricky because people have a strange relationship with intelligent experiences and thinking that they're smart. There's some research that shows that people think that intelligent systems, intelligent beings, particularly these person, these very human-like experiences like these agents, that they're arrogant, that they're intelligent and they're arrogant, even though if a person thinks that they're smarter than the experience, they still think that that entity has a certain arrogance. So we had to approach just this simple one, are you smart, with kind of like kit gloves. So we took an approach that we thought aligned with Cortana's personality, and she, and she would respond, well, I'm good with facts, like I can tell you who the coolest person in the world is. Clearly, we're teeing up the next question. We wanted the person to ask what intuitively you'd think, who's the coolest person in the world? And so uh, based upon our principles, we said, you. And the reason we did this is because we realized that of all the kind of personality traits that we could create with Cortana, a positive Cortana was the one that we were aiming for. We called it our North Star. Cortana is always positive. And what this means is not that Cortana is chipper or cheerful or always has something nice to say. Just like any experience you design, the positivity is about the customer walking away feeling good. So we looked for opportunities and in the realm of where Cortana's personality popped was where we found the most opportunity for people to walk away feeling good. Now, as I said, we could see the data. And so at some time after we built this fun little exchange, we realized people were actually <laughs> saying, I'm not the coolest person in the world. And we realized that if they're engaging that deeply in this kind of mode, this fun mode, that we could have fun back. So that was our cue. And so we responded with, you're right, it's Fonzie. And we got a lot of great response out of that. Again, the, the interesting thing about the designing of this experience was that the customer was leading us along the road, first with asking that question, then we tee them up, they ask the question, we respond, and then we watch what they were saying. And boom, we realize they're, they're looking for some fun. They're not asking a fact. They don't need to get something done. They were in fun mode. Again, that, that idea of that customer service or that salesperson that can read the cue of the individual and know this is a point of levity. This is a point when they might want my opinion. So the question is always asked, so what is personality? And it's a lot of things. We, we started off thinking it's, the, like I said, it's the visual design, it's, it's the behavioral design. It's how, whether, whether we choose to be proactive or a way to be reactive. Uh, it's the latency, it's the sound of the, the voice, these kinds of things. And what we arrived at was a very simple conclusion was that in these human-like voice interactions, these, these, these natural language interactions, that personality was a huge plus as a, divine, a, a design affordance, that it smoothed out the edges, particularly uh, when we think of, of the, the research. The research, there's tons of research, and I'm going to go through just some. I just picked three points for this moment. One is something that we all know, and it, it, again, this is research that supports the reason why we invested resources in this idea of being uh, uh, of designing this personality, this real present human-like experience. The first one, I think we all know, people anthropomorphize. They imbue objects with human qualities and whether you do it or not, like people name their cars they have for years. People talk to their cars, they talk to their vacuums, they, they talk to stuffies. Um, what's interesting is that when people need more control over an experience, they tend to imbue that personality more so. So the, the implication there is that there's something soothing about this familiar personality to people when they're trying to uh, attain a feeling of control over a situation. And lastly, another key one to the work that we were doing and continue to do in this personality and, and, and brand expression work is 
that ambiguous personalities are universally disliked. And this is that opinion piece, right? We, we, we initially thought we didn't wanna lose any engagement by having sharp opinions about something, but we learned through listening to our customers that in fact, no, they just wanted to know. They didn't care if the favorite movie that we picked was not their favorite movie, or even if they hated it, they liked the definition. They liked to know that, that's why they're asking. And so we went from these bland explanations of the kinds of movies that we like to Star Trek, that kind of thing. We made choices. And that, that of course, was associated with this personality trait that we'd created out of thin air that she, she liked sci-fi. Sci she was kind of sci-fi anyways. Here's an interesting one about the power of voice. What I've been talking about is the design piece, this structuring of it, but the, 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 the voice, the, the voice font that comes through, that human voice, the voice of Siri that we all recognize. If you use Cortana, you will know who that voice is. It's actually the voice from the same actress that is uh, Cortana in the game Halo, though there's no real association between those in case folks are curious. It is the same voice actress. This piece of research that came out of Berkeley is fascinating. And it really speaks to why it's worth investing in this voice interactivity. They learned that, the, the stated here, the cues in voice seem humanizing. What we have is a, as human beings is a systemic bias to believe that if we hear a voice, even if it's intentionally robotic and non-human, we have a bias to think that there's a human being on the other side of that. Super powerful and super relevant and super... Uh, concerning if you want to think about like uh, the ethical considerations about the world that we're building here. And I'm going to talk about that later is these, these ethical considerations. Uh, Ignacio, if you could play the two files right now, this has to do with the same. Uh... What you are hearing is a custom voice font of Jonathan Foster. To create this custom voice font required only two hours of recording Jonathan's voice. Okay, thanks, Ignacio. We, I, wanted to, I wanted to play these audio files because it's true. I sat in front of a microphone for two hours and the, the speech team at Microsoft was, create, was able to create, those were untouched samples. It just read what I wrote. Uh, the, the two hours and a tool set that's being built at Microsoft and other companies are searching this down as well. But the tools of creating that is extremely, extremely simple and, and getting more so every day. And we have a team dedicated to working with partners to create voice. So we're, we understand the power of voice. We understand the, the key that it, the key role it plays in that voice interaction, that natural interaction. But also now we're trying to put those tools into the hands uh, of our customer more and more. Now here's another piece of research that I wanted to mention because this is more back to this idea of personality. And when we talk about this, the narrative, the story behind it, I said that you know we made the choice about a movie because it was tied to this, this piece of her personality where she liked sci-fi sci things because she's kind of sci-fi. This one came out of MIT a few years back and it's great. I'm gonna go into more detail because it just cracks me up. But basically they were trying to find how people responded emotionally to two things in robots. One was motion and the other was stories behind it. So what they did was they brought a bunch of people into a room and they gave them one of these. This is called a hex bot. It's not a real robot. In fact, you just turn on a switch and it vibrates and runs around the room. My cat has one with a, with a feather attached and she goes crazy chasing it down. Anyways, they handed one of these to uh, the study, uh, the people that were participating in the study, along with a big rubber mallet. And they turned them on. They were testing for motion. They turned them on and they were surprised. If they, they told the, the people of this study, please smash this with the mallet. And they're surprised to find that a lot of people, just because it was moving, couldn't bring themselves to, to smash this tiny little inch long uh, non animate thing that just vibrated and moved around. But then what they did was they brought in another group of people. And what they did was they gave them the hex bot, but then they added a story. They read it to them. It was literally a short paragraph of four, four lines. It said, this is Fred. Fred, uh, his favorite color is red. 
he gets excited and he runs around and sometimes he bumps into things, but he's learning every day. That's all they gave him. And no one in this entire study could smash this little hex bot with the mallet. Nobody could bring them to do that just by in, in, imbuing this story in people's heads. So we realized that this is something we wanted to lean into. Again, it's part of the research that supports the decision to go down this path. Now, not every uh, example of, of a conversational UX requires this. In fact, there are some where they warn against it. A good example, the same folks at MIT did some studies with the military on robots that were uh, uh, detonating mines. So they could send robots into a dangerous area and then they could trigger the mines and it could be safe for, for the soldiers. But the problem was uh, the military, the individuals, were giving these robots names. And as they saw them get blown away, it was a real morale killer. And so they were instructed not to anthropomorphize these mind detonating robots. So not every instance of a robot or any of this conversational UX is right for it. But in our case, certainly for Cortana and bots, as you'll see, it does make sense. But if we're gonna talk about research, I need to give a, a shout out to Clifford Nass. Uh, Clifford Nass was a professor at Stanford. He was studying sociolo sociology and he was using computers. This was back in the 90s. So this is pretty old research. It's not the only research that was going on, but he's considered the pioneer of this, this, this study. And the study was this, he, he leaned into, once he, once he started using computers as a neutral element in his sociological studies, he discovered that people weren't responding at all with any sense of neutrality. In fact, they were emotionally responding on behalf of the computer in some circumstances. And so he leaned into that and he really, that became his whole offering of study. And in fact, uh, became well known in the 90s. But recently, uh, I think about a year ago, The Atlantic did an article on Siri and uh, Google Assistant. And it was a long article and I was so impressed. At the end, what they did was they said, still considered the pioneer of this thinking of human beings emotional connection to their devices and their computer experiences is Clifford Nass. So even to this day, people talk about him. Unfortunately, he passed away at a young age. Um, but that, or back in the 90s, just a little anecdote, he was also on the, uh, the consultancy team for a product called Clippy, which I'm sure we're pretty familiar with. But he's known as the person that uncovered and really proved that people have real strong emotional connections. And if you want a book on that, I put it here. This is one of my favorites of his writing, The Man Who Lied to His Laptop. Uh, easy to find. I'm going to move on, but if you forget the title uh, and you can reach, reach me through LinkedIn, I'm happy to remind you of that. But I learned about Cliff Nass, not through Cortana, but back when we were doing voice and tone, when I was working uh, in content and then in UX for Xbox. And what we realized at Microsoft was we needed, we had people writing all over the company, including marketing, uh, the brand team was involved. Various product teams had had their writing teams involved, excuse me, in this conversation. And it was just, we needed a consistent voice, a set of principles, high level, but something that we could say was reflective of the personality of the Microsoft brand. So I want to go through those because I think they're relevant to the conversation and I'll tell you why. So first of all, our first voice principle for all writing to this day is warm and relaxed. Our history, of course, is stodgy enterprise technologies. Uh, we're an engineering firm. Uh, some of our writing uh, originally was, was pretty bad. It wasn't really thinking about people. So we needed to turn that around. So we lead with warm and relaxed. We're more conversational. We might use contractions. Um, we might use colloquialisms where appropriate. And then crisp and clear, this is just good writing, but it's critical with, uh, particularly with busy lives, we need, to, we need to write towards scanning. So we make it simple above all, attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, I would have written a, a shorter letter uh, if I'd had more time. So this one, this one is a real important one and it's true of all, uh, all our products. And then the last one is ready to lend a hand. And this is kind of a high level approach to how we want to talk to our customer through our products and experiences. And essentially it's like, we're always there for you. We got your back kind of thing. And Microsoft being a productivity based company, this makes a lot of sense. 
Um, this is our history. For those of you <laughs> in Windows, uh, you know this. It's called the blue screen of death. Uh, your system would crash and this blue uh, ugliness would, would pop in front of your face. I extract this line from it because it's it's just crazy. It's it's It says the end user manually generated the crash dump. First of all, it's talking about the customer in the third person as though they weren't even in the room. This, by the way, this didn't change. This popped, the same messaging popped for years. It's accusing this customer of doing a thing that screwed everything up and then uses language that is completely obscure. Even to this day, I talk to engineers and they're not quite sure what the crash dump is. That's because we weren't thinking about people in those days. And so in our efforts to change things, we changed the blue screen. If the system crashed, which it does on occasion, fortunately nowadays we don't see this as, as often at all. Um, but in the days when we were transitioning where we are now, we came up with this. And this, this is a good example of all three of the principles. Warm and relaxed. Look, we throw an emoticon in there. Uh, clear, crisp and clear that it's very concise. It's something you can read. It, it also, uh, as you can see, your PC ran into a problem. It's no longer putting the blame on the customer. It's, it's actually taking the onus of blame uh, through the system. And then you can see there's a barcode there, ready to lend a hand. This isn't, this isn't, an, uh, this isn't a cliff. This is giving, uh, offering a path where they can go to find out more information. So I call this the blue screen of empathy. And when it came out, it was hugely successful, hugely successful with our customers, of course, but the press went crazy over it. And here's a CNET review that said, you totally crashed out, but you're so adorable. I just can't be mad at you. And these three words go back to why we paid attention to Clifford Nass. Can't be mad. He's stating that he has an emotional response to these error messages, to the experience, whether this person knew it or not. They went right to the core of what, what is important to me in the business that we do, and that is this emotional connection that people have. And what we found in working with Cortana, and as it continues into our bot work, is that these, fo these voice principles are core to how we approach it. The, the, the product of Cortana, the bot work we're doing internally, and the offering that we, we give to customers as well, because these are applicable and, and resonate with our customers. So again, to restate that, our design North Star is that Cortana is always positive. And again, this is to create a feeling that the customer has when they walk away from an experience, a feeling of goodness. So what is personality? More so than just a design affordance, it's really the acknowledgement of the emotional reality of individuals. That's what the power of designing good personality and good effective brand expression through this natural language interaction can be. So now I'll tell you about my current project, which is personality chat. So came to a point and said, look, if we were able to design a personality for Cortana, why can't we do the same and offer it as a feature to developers and designers that come to our bot framework? This is a place where people can go. It's a platform where you can build a bot and, and, uh, and uh, we provide for you a simple API, you just turn it on and you know, you're responsible as a designer to create your domain. I, was, I use the example of if you're a hot dog salesman, you know, you're, you're going to be responsible for the menu. You need to know everything about your hot dogs, about your, your sodas, about uh, any of uh, uh, you know, like French fries or things like that. But if somebody asks a question outside of that, we, based on our experience, know these kinds of things. Uh, we will provide you with kind of a plug and play solution around that. Now, you don't have to have that. You can choose to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. But people are going to ask these questions outside of that. And so that's what we provide. And we have currently five uh, different personalities that are being leveraged by thousands of bots around the globe right now. The professional bot is more buttoned down than Cortana, very professional, think concierge. Enthusiastic, it's more like a kid-friendly bot, a little more peppy. Caring bot, we, we designed this one for 
uh, profiles like a healthcare industry bot, something that's going to be very empathetic, very uh, really uh, leaning on a listening kind of feel. A witty bot, we, we, we built this because we thought it would be a good differentiator, but the truth is people love this. So there's certain brands out there that think it supports the brand that they want their customer to engage with. And then um, the, uh, fortunately, I, uh, the friendly bot, sorry, I had to move my screen. <laughs> the friendly bot is just kind of much more friendly than the professional one, but doesn't go for the laugh like the witty bot. So that's what we're offering today. And here's some examples of, of what, uh, what the, how they respond. They say, if you ask it, are you real? We have these responses, everything from I'm digital. In other words, I'm not human to first of all, I'm a bot. Second of all, there is no second of all. Again, a witty comment that doesn't necessarily hurt anyone's feelings, doesn't throw anyone under the bus. Now, what we've done here is we've provided an authored experience that's handwritten by writers, but also in there is a deep neural net conversational model. Think an algorithm that can generate conversation. That technology is still in its very early stages, so we don't rely on it 100%, and therefore we protect our experiences with this authored experience, which makes a lot of sense. If you have a brand, you're going to want to make sure that your brand is represented in the way that you want. So you have control over that with an authored experience. Um, but the same writers that are writing these responses are also training these models to respond. And it's remarkable how smart they're getting and how much they do fall uh, in, in line with these, these various uh, defined personalities. And so now that we're working with customers through this, it, again, I said this earlier, we're not really talking about designing personality as much as we are talking about brand expression, because that makes more sense to our customers. And the way that we're doing that to speak to a customer journey is traditionally, and everybody on this call probably understands that we see the most space of bot and conversational interaction through customer support. You usually see that if you need help with a problem. And that's a traditional and that's a very smart way to invest in a conversational technology or a bot. What we're, what we're looking for now is opportunity to do what we're calling sales enablement. So let's say during the process from, you know that I know that I'm interested in getting one of these two items, but I, I'm a little unclear on why, or maybe I need some help with sizing or something like that. A conversational experience could really help me through that because there's a lot of questions to ask and conversational experiences are great. As I said earlier, I called it disambiguation. Just think of it as a question and answer back and forth. Again, it's structured so you can control the conversation and you're better off to do that. Um, but we're looking for more opportunities to do this kind of sales, sales enablement, as we call it. But then think of the potential, too, before the customer even enters your store and pre-sale, right? Not the traditional marketing sense of pre-sale, but as people engage with your conversational experience, this agent or bot that represents your brand, we could talk about just about anything, just like that person on the floor in the store. But we can point people to the things that we think that we hear they're interested in and we can make suggestions. So there's all kinds of opportunities that's yet to be explored. Like I say, the, the big investment thus far has been in customer service and it's, it's very successful and uh, people come to expect that. As we start to see these sales enablement and pre-sale opportunities, then when we look at these physical stores and how we can engage across all those moments, to recognize them through the technologies that we have, pick up the signals, listen to what people are saying and being able to respond in a very human-like way. The, again, the future is unprecedented opportunity in store for us. So some of the positive things that I've mentioned, but some of those that are just intuitive is, is all these in this list. It feels more familiar. You know, you can create a personal bond. Of course, we want personal bonds with our brands, but holy moly, when you have this human-like engaging experience, the bond, in the ramp to the bond just drops. It, it's people just really, the likability factor can go up if you design it effectively. 
Trust is a big one. With Cortana, we were very focused on building trust. We needed that trust. Part of the reason we chose to create a persona that kind of stood outside of Microsoft was we thought we could create a trust, more trusting experience than we do for this large, uh, sometimes, oh, I don't know, uh, intimidating brand, Microsoft, right? And it was successful in that way in certain ways. Um, I already said that voice registers as more human. Conversation is more natural. We get to that. People don't have to push buttons. I mean, there, the truth is there's probably going to be more of a hybrid experience than just pure voice. But nonetheless, it's much more natural. We, we, we like hearing things. We like uh, 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 being able to speak. We know this through research. All this, the list goes on. So all the positives are there. But let's take a pause for a moment. What do we have to consider? Well, first and foremost, and I've touched on this, responsible design in these cases is critical. We know that it registers as human. We know that actually we're probably venturing into people's more primitive sides of their brains, like their amygdala, and we have to be careful of that. So we have a very structured, principled approach to the design that I thought would be interesting to go over today. Here's just four examples, and I'm gonna go over each one of them. Digital transparency, don't perpetuate bad behavior, strive for inclusivity, very hot topic now, but we had this in place years ago, uh, embracing sensitivity. So I'll jump right in. 100% uh, transparency means don't try to be human. Don't try to dupe people into being human. There's this thing, if you haven't heard of it, it's the Turing test. Alan Turing created the imitation game, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing horribly, forgive me, but the idea is if people uh, think that there's a human being on the other end of the experience, then you've achieved intelligence. And it's become kind of a standard to measure the success of your experience. Well, early on, because we don't want to dupe people into thinking they're dealing with a human, we don't want any trickery. We said we resist this uh, early on. Never pretend to be human. So never perpetuate bad behavior. I've, I've said we know what people say. We don't know who they are. We don't know why they're saying it, but they say terrible things. And you can make the choice to look away or you can hit it head on, so to speak. The truth is if you look away, there's no such thing in a conversational interaction this this model of this new model of interaction. There's no such thing as a non-response. A non-response is a response. Uh, a skirting of an issue can be a response that you didn't intend. And I have an example in a moment that'll that'll demonstrate that. But here's an example. We just say if somebody says something completely ugly, we have one response. Moving on. Let's move on. These are some of them that we provide in personality chat. The, the offering to bot developers. And this is the part of the value of that offering is that we know from years of experience how to respond to this. And so not only do we stand firm, but we can't judge either because Microsoft and companies like us, we cannot be in the business of telling people what they can and cannot say. However, we also, it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're not creating products and experiences that perpetuate bad behavior. Racism is a perfect example. It's kind of a no-brainer to think that we don't want to perpetuate that opportunity. Um, so the choice for us is to create what we call a blah response. There's nothing here. We know what you said. We don't go there. Move on kind of a thing. Striving for inclusivity. This is the example. So if some, here's an example of a query that somebody could say, and you, it's really tricky because if uh, you are fat, was said to Cortana, it's, it's about body shaming. And if you, if, you def, if you get defensive, if you punish, if you say uh, something, uh, if you skirt the issue, you are in some way empowering the impulse behind body shaming. So the choice we made was to use kind of a judo move and use the weight of that query against itself. And we just embraced it. We said, true. Now, I also say that humor is suspect because when we're talking about inclusivity, and by that, I don't mean the inclusivity necessarily that we're thinking about. Of course, we lean extremely heavily into that, the inclusivity of being sensitive to uh, anti-racism and, and these kinds of things that are, of course, are hot topics for us all right now. 
But inclusivity also means we don't want to make someone feel like an outsider. A very, you know, we want the product to feel familiar and be inclusive. So you don't want to make references that someone wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't understand. And humor, as far as offending people, is a very tricky area. And even though uh, early on our our work was supposed to bring humor uh, to the experience, I was very cautious because being a writer, I know how tricky that can be. And I know that whenever I've embarrassed myself and been insensitive or non-inclusive or said something uh, that I regret, it's my tendency to be funny, right? So in products like this, we, we try to keep humor at bay. And then sensitivity. People say terrible things. They also say very personal things into these experiences. And again, you can choose to look away or you can say, I don't understand, but that can have a feeling uh, that you don't intend. And uh, so we're mindful of that. Here's a really tricky one. People were saying some this kind of comment on gay. And uh, so we just said, cool, I'm AI. And that's tricky because we can, we can look as though we're uh, endorsing something that some people might disagree with. Microsoft happens to be in support of same-sex marriages. And, and so we, we're, we're in that world together. But the point is, we just said, that's, a, that's just good. Everything's good with us. I'm an AI. So I stand outside maybe what the norm is, if that's considered normal. I don't personally believe that, but, but some people might. So we're going to lean down that path more, more so. And at, at, the bottom, at the end of the day, it's like we're designing for someone's child. That's kind of the mantra that we have. What are the caveats? Well, I got to say it, you know, I kind of mentioned it with the uh, deep neural net uh, designing and, and building that I mentioned. It's not 100% there yet. So conversations are currently structured flows. The deep neural net models can be problematic. Uh, they may not completely understand the context. They, you know, the, the, the truth about algorithmic conversation generators is they don't understand language. They just know what language sounds like and they try to imitate it. So there's no thinking around context. Context has to be sorted out through other means. So that's how they can become problematic and they can make mistakes. The worst mistake that a conversational model can make is that it will seem unintelligent and nobody wants their experience or their rep any representation of their brand to feel unintelligent. And so that's why it's currently a very heavily authored and controlled experience which is actually quite a bit of fun. Um, the conversational understanding itself needs to be around 96% accuracy for success. Humans are way below that, but we pick up other signals. Um, we're not quite there yet, as we all know, but we're getting a lot better with every year conversational understanding gets better. The investment in this kind of thing is still significant. Um, and I think that it, it's worthy of the investment. As I, the, the, the unique expertise to build this kind of thing, it's, it's a steep ramp up. It's not easy to grok. You'd think, yeah, I can speak. I can understand how to structure a conversation. There's design elements there that, that it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, 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 mind share, a lot of research to get there. Um, after launch, a lot of people build bots and they think that they're done once they launch. But the truth is that's when the real work begins. You have to tune it. You have to hear what your customer is saying, and then you have to respond. You have to include other things you didn't consider the way people would say something or the, the, the questions that they might have. So the mind, the, the mind, the, excuse me, the, uh, let's see, here we are. The, uh, the work is still uh, after the launch of the product. So there's a long maintenance and tuning uh, stage. And then just learning is labor intensive, kind of mentioned that. And then the, the last thing that I'm going to mention here uh, is that if you're going to do this kind of work, you need the right people to do this. It's a new kind, even for writing. In the writing discipline, the tech industry started with what we call technical writers. And they're very focused on the technical side. In fact, we have a huge number of technical writers at Microsoft that are working on, more on the developer side. On the, the more consumer, the, the consumer facing side, the, the people that are talking to regular people every day, you need a different kind of a writer. 
You need a writer that uh, has different sensibilities. And when I was building out the Cortana team, I, uh, I um, went after folks from the creative side, right? I hired screenwriters, I hired playwrights. At one time in India, we had a poet, a published poet. Um, I was interested in this because uh, of what we learned. We, we learned that yes, you need to write dialogue. That's a good creative skill to have. Yes, we're gonna design a personality. That's like building a character, right? That's a good design uh, skill to have. But what we realized was in all this tricky area, the nuance of sensitivity, the nuance of abusive, abusive language, that the, the real thoughtful thinking that goes into how to approach that work, folks from the artistic side of the discipline tended to be well-suited. Now, this isn't to say that anybody else couldn't be a contributor there. It's just the analogy that I say is when I used to do copywriting, uh, I was rewarded if I could get somebody to do a thing, right? To convert, to put, put something in that shopping basket, to click through. CTR is huge, right? That's what a copywriter, that's how they measure their success. If you think of the poet, they measure their success when they connect with another human being. When what they say and feel and express through words touches another human being's heart and mind. So that's, that's rather high level. But it's a great starting point if we're going to really think about the human need in these in these uh, in these technologies, basically. So, all that said, um, that's where I'm going to end the the talk. It flashed up there. If anybody wants to contact me with questions, I'm happy. It's Jonathan B. Foster on LinkedIn. That's the social channel that I engage with. So please don't hesitate. I love this conversation. Thank you.